without further ado, I'm going to welcome our first speaker to the stage. Uh, everybody, if you could please give a huge round of applause for the first speaker of 2022 at Shepherd DM, Katie Thompson, of not Lingo. <laughs> Okay, oh gosh. Like no. Oh, there you are. I didn't know they were burgers. I'm very excited about that now, so I'll definitely go and see the after party. Um, so thank you everyone for having me. Um, it is a pleasure to be here and all the other stuff that stand-up comedians say. Um, I'm not going to be making that many jokes because it'll be really, really awkward if you don't laugh. Um, so yes, as you just said, Katie Thompson, not Lingo. Um, Katie Lingo is a business that I set up in 2016. Started off as a bit of a side hustle. I was working in a digital marketing agency. And I've got a background in sort of journalism. So I trained with the National Council for the Training for Journalists and then moved on to the Chartered Institute of Marketing. So it's got that sort of traditional dinosaur stuff, as it were, um, with um, more sort of modern you know, SEO, content marketing kind of things. Um, and today, I want to talk to you guys as sort of business owners or agency workers. So. I'm sure a lot of people here either work for agencies or maybe own agencies or are sort of involved in the digital marketing space, I hope, otherwise you're at the wrong place. A few home truths about working in this space. We all have clients. They all want to speak to the manager. But they're not all the same. Now, as much as we'd love to say that we love all our clients the same and we treat them all the same, they all get that impeccable service, they are all different, so we have to be honest with ourselves. They could vary in terms of industry. So if someone comes to me and says, Katie, we write about digital marketing, that's not going to take up as much time as it were if I want to write about rocket science. So I've got to think about the resource and the time I'm putting into that. It might be a different service. If someone comes to me and says, Katie, I need to do blogging, brilliant, I can do that. If someone comes to me and says, Katie, I need to do PPC, again, I might have to outsource that. That's going to take me more time, more resource. Prestige. We all have our dream clients, someone that we really want to work with, someone we'd absolutely trip over ourselves to work with. We'd love to have their name on our website, love to have that testimonial. But do they have higher expectations? So again, that's going to affect how we treat them. For sentiment, sentimental value, do we work with them because we've got a bit of a personal relationship with them? Are they a charity or a community interest company? Do you have something that's a bit more emotional, not necessarily about sort of the monetary value we're getting from them? And finally, all of these things affect the price. Again, we'd love to say that all of our clients are paying the same, but that's simply not true, and that's for a lot of reasons. So, pricing. Pricing is quite a dark art. Um, I'm sure you guys all have different pricing structures. For me, um, it varies entirely as um, someone who does sort of outsource content marketing. You could do it sort of the plumber's way, by the hour, but then if it doesn't take very long, you're not gonna earn a lot of money. You could do it by the day. I know a lot of agencies prefer to work on a day rate, but again, are you putting too much too little time into that? You could do it by the project, say, okay, I need X, Y, Z, I need to research this, I need to call upon this person. Or you could do it by the quantity, say you've got like a retainer, so I might say I've got four blog posts per month at this price. So there's lots of ways we can look at it. Then of course, there's the value. Now obviously we can offer value to our clients in terms of expertise or just generally being easy to work with, minimizing their stress. But they can also offer value to us. We need to remember that this is a two-way relationship. So how can they make themselves appealing for you to work with them? Well, again, we talked about that prestige. They could have a good name. Um, I, for one, have just started working with Reuters, which is like my ultimate fangirl moment. Um, so I can't wait to put their name on my website. Again, I trip over myself to work with them. Um, by appreciating your work, you'd be amazed at how much more inclined you are to help someone when they're just nice to you. It just makes a difference. Um, by minimizing stress, if someone gives you a good brief, there's so much less back and forth, you get the job done quicker, everybody's happy, brilliant, valuable. And for by coming back, by being that secure client, by knowing you've got that guaranteed revenue month on month. So that's how they can demonstrate value to you. So with all these things in mind, I've created what I like to call the ideal client. This is another Emily in Paris. Still, anyone watched Emily in Paris? You remember this guy slicing off his finger? Oh. Um, so yeah, the ideal client doesn't slice with his fingers, but um, sets a clear brief so you know exactly what you want. Again, less back and forth there. Respects your boundaries, isn't you call, calling up at three o'clock in the morning. Um, understands your pricing, whether that's by the day or by the hour or by the project. Um, has clear expectations, doesn't say, get me to the cover Google tomorrow for online casinos. 
brilliant, no, ridiculous, um, and comes back for more. So, these clients sadly don't come in all the time. I'm just going to get a sip of water, you guys can still get thanks. <laughs> so again, we do need to consider all of these different things. Um, you know, is it an easy service? Have they got a good name? Do we love them for other reasons? But we also need to consider, okay, it's not just about the money, it's not just about the value they're bringing to us. Are they actually more trouble than they're worth? Are they giving us a lot of stress? So one way I like to kind of look at my sort of roster of clients is to put them into tiers. Now, this is a very sort of top level view and we're gonna kind of break this down as we go on through the slides. If we look at our clients in terms of volume and revenue, Volume could be how much work they're giving you at any one time, or it could be how much work they're sort of giving you over the space of a year, so let's say retaining work, X number of blog posts per month. And then revenue, obviously, how much money you're making on each individual bit of work. So you can see here, I might have someone um, who's quite high value, they've got a big budget, brilliant, happy days, but for whatever reason, they don't come in that often. So for me, that's someone like Reuters, they come in every three months with a white paper. Okay, what do I want to do with them? I want to get them in more often. Or you might have someone who doesn't have a lot of money and doesn't actually come in that often. But rather than saying, oh, I'll just get rid of them straight away, you might want to hold on to them for, again, those sentimental reasons. There might be a charity, there might be a friend. So this is a really top level way of looking at it. But we're going to break it down a little bit more. So I'm going to baffle you now with a few numbers, but don't worry, we're not going to go into them too much. Bit of science, bit of magic, bit of help from my partner, Craig, who is a bit of a data visualization wizard. So here's a bit of a theory. It's something we've adapted. I will preface this and say it's not something we came up with ourselves. Um, a guy called Bob Gorton wrote a book called Boosting Sales, very original. Um, basically, what we want to do is, as an agency or company, or whatever we are, we need to figure out how much resource we actually have. Then we need to identify what our break-even point is, how much work we're putting out versus how much revenue do we need. Um, then we need to see how often these clients are coming in, how much they're paying, and then we're going to put them into clusters and then decide what to do with that client based on the value they're bringing in. And ultimately, we want to aim for that golden ratio, that cheesy name I came up with at the beginning. So, number one, again, big scary term, saleable resource capacity, not as difficult as it sounds. In a service-based industry, this is essentially the number of hours you can put out to a client per year. So let's say you've got four people on the books, you've got seven days a week, 52 weeks a year, bing, bang, bosh, take away the holidays, you've got roughly 6,440 hours of work you can actually produce. Obviously, it's more complicated than that, but just as a guideline. Next, don't be freaked out, it looks scary. We're actually gonna figure out how much money we need to make to break even. So this figure up here, this is something I've taken from my own figures and sort of extrapolated it to pretend I'm four people. Um, we've got the cost of sales, so that's a variable cost. So what I mean there is if I've got a business development manager, let's say they're on 25 grand a year, I've got two, I've got 50. If I've got three, I've got 75 grand. That's going to give me a profit margin, excuse me, yeah, gross margin of 81.57%, which means that's going to scale with it. But I've also got fixed costs, which are 114,000 pounds, 199 pence. That's based on things like office costs, things that aren't going to change. So, put one of these into the calculator, and I've realized that to make that 271 grand, sorry, sorry excuse me, to make, to break even, I need to be making 140,000 pounds a year. So, if we've got that saleable resource capacity, so that's 6,440 hours, and we need to make 140,000 pounds a year just to break even, then we've essentially got a figure here. This is how much we need to charge people per hour. So, in this case, it's 21 pounds 74. So, I need to make sure that for every hour I'm selling, that is how much minimum a client is paying me. So, again, don't be freaked out. <laughs> We're looking at actually how much that client is worth in terms of added value. So, we sell them X number of hours. So, we might tell them this is going to take two hours, but it actually only took one hour, but they've paid for two. So, we've got a column here, actual hours spent on client versus hours sold. If we're spending fewer hours, then we're making more than that uh, £21.74, so we've got added value. Conversely, if we're spending too much time on them, then we're going into the red. That's not necessarily a bad thing, because if we've got enough clients in the green, they could effectively be subsidising them, and you might be holding on to that client for whatever reason, again, those sentimental reasons. But essentially, we're looking for that £21.74 per hour minimum. Now, in terms of the volume, 
Um, we want to look at our clients. We want to tier them from sort of tiny through to huge. So that's basically how much of our time, how much of that saleable resource capacity are they taking up from, from the whole business over the course of a year. So we can tier them from tiny through to huge. So for example, um, we've got client uh, A here. So we know they've bought 245 hours, um, sorry, they've bought 272 hours, but they've only taken 245. So we divide that by the 6,440, that comes up with just under 4% of our time, which makes them a medium-sized client. So we want a kind of even spread. Then we've got to look at how much money they're actually making us. So again, we've got that break-even point here. We want to see if they're um, a lead client, so they're losing us money, all the way through to platinum clients. And this all depends on how much money they're making us per hour based on that break-even point. So we're going to go up in increments of 10%. So if they're sort of 20% above, then they're an acceptable client. So anywhere from between 27 to 31 pounds per hour, etc., etc. So the more money they're making, the more likely they're going to be in those sort of gold, platinum categories. So now we know we've got clients in terms of time. We, we can look at them from tiny all the way up to huge, and then we've got them in terms of monetary terms. We can plot them on a graph. And I'm not sure if you see here, but it's sort of green, red. Can, can you see that all right? It's, uh, it's a lot clearer on my screen. So we can plot all of these clients over the course of year into these individual quadrants and see where we're spending our time and how much value we're getting from each of those clients. So. Just as an example, here you've got sort of um, your red tier. So these are what you would call your lead clients. Um, so the further over the left they are, this is their time scale. That means the more um, time they're taking up, and the lower they are, the less money they're bringing in. What's really important here is to look at the figures. So this, this client L says it's bringing in 15,000 pounds a year. Client M is 4,000 pounds a year. If you look at that, in a really kind of top level way, you think, oh, well, this client's great. They're bringing me 15 grand a year. But we haven't considered how much time they're actually taking up relative to what you've sold them. So actually, this client, which is 4,000 pounds, is worth a lot more to you. So it's really important that you don't have people over here because they're taking up too much time and they're not bringing you in enough money. Likewise, you might have someone over here. Okay, they're not bringing in a lot of money, but they're not taking up a lot of time either. So they're not a huge stress to you, and again, there might be that sort of sentimental value. So this isn't the end of the world. These clients you certainly want to think about either upselling to or getting rid of altogether. Then you've got sort of your bronze clients. So again, you don't want them too far over here because then they're taking up too much time, um, but they're not bringing in you a huge amount of money. So they're somewhere in the middle. They're kind of clients you just want to keep nurturing. They're solid, they're reliable, they keep coming back month in, month out. So pretty stress-free, you want a nice balance of these. Um, you might consider sort of upselling to them or giving them different services. Just make sure you're keeping them happy. Then we have these clients over here. And these ones, we talked about this briefly before. These ones don't come in very often, but when they do, they've got big budgets, which means basically we want to be on their radar a lot more often. We want to just remind them that we're here and that we can actually service them throughout the year. It doesn't have to be once every quarter. And ideally, we want to push them over to this section. So as you can see, we're not spending a lot of time on them. We want to get them higher volume into this stage so they can ultimately become these sort of uh, green quadrant clients. And then finally, here you've got your silvers, your gold, your platinum. So um, lead, bronze, silver, gold, platinum. The more people you have over here, the more money you're essentially making relative to the time you're spending. Obviously, someone like here would call them like a unicorn client, but we have to be realistic. We can't have all perfect clients because if we were to have all perfect clients, if we lost one of them, we'd lose a huge chunk of our revenue. So we need to have an even spread here. That's why it's so important, yes, to have these, but not to discount the bronze clients either. So just to give you um, a little bit more of a visualization here, we're tiering them by their frequency, how often it comes in, how much work they actually give us, and sort of how much monetary value they bring in. So you can take a mental snapshot on that, I'll take the slides at the end. So why do we do this? Um, this is an exercise that we perform on our own business sort of once every quarter. Um, it's just to give us a bit of visibility really, um, just to see, oh actually, such and such a person hasn't been in touch for a while and I wouldn't have even known that if I'd not looked that up. Um, it's a really good way of actually getting more value from your existing clients. I think we've all heard statistics like it costs five times more to acquire a new client than it does to retain an existing one. 
Um, and it's a good way of kind of moving your clients over into those sort of green zones. Um, we applied the strategy to an e-learning provider. They were more sort of blue client. And we just gave them a little nudge, just said, hi there, I saw this thought of you. And suddenly they thought of us and they actually signed up to a 12 month retainer, which means big budgets, regular. Brilliant, fantastic. Likewise, things like the red clients, we know that they're almost making us a loss. So we upsold to them, told them we do press releases as well. Bing, bang, bosh, they're bringing in more money, so we push them over into the orange. So it's just a really good way of kind of planning out your year, knowing where to allocate your resource and realizing actually where you're spending too much time. And it's also a good way of saving money as well. It's not necessarily about making more money from your existing clients, but actually realizing maybe I'm putting too much time into this one. And it can sound a little bit cutthroat, but it can be really helpful in the long term. It's a strategy that my partner, he used to work at a travel company, and they realized they were spending too much time on hen and stag do clients, and they have just more trouble than they were worth, and they were actually losing money. So the revenue sounds great on the surface, but once you drill, drill down into it, you realize, actually, there's a lot more to it. So we've talked about these client tiers. What actually is the golden ratio? Well, as before, yes, we'd love to say we've got a million platinum clients, but we've got to be careful there, because if we're putting too much time into those, then we could be risking losing out on those sort of middle tiers, those silver and gold. So ideally, 10% of the unicorns or platinums, whatever you call them, moving down. So gold, again, slightly higher, but not too much. Silver is kind of your sweet spot, because these are your regular, dependable clients, not too much stress, nice amount of revenue. Bronze, again, a few, just keep them in. And the lead, that's an interesting one, because you could probably think we're making a loss, but not necessarily. There might be more sort of heart, emotional reasons in there, like I say, charities, friends. As I say, it's not always black and white. I realize this sounds really cutthroat and it's all about the bottom lines, but it's not just about that. There are other things that affect your decisions. So it might be a case of, yes, technically I'm losing money, but I'm working with them. It's really good for my PR because they're a charity or they can refer me to other people. So there are other things to consider when you're looking at all your clients. Likewise, nothing is set in stone. As I say, we do this sort of once every quarter. Um, just to review things, and you can sort of scale it and adapt it based on how many people you have, the resource, the skills you have in-house. So, um, not to sell, but if you guys really aren't sure where you're at um, with your current clients, it is something that we're considering offering to people as a service just to get a bit more visibility on their current clients and hopefully to grow, not necessarily from getting new sales, but from nurturing the people that you already have. So, that is it from me. Thank you very much. No idea how long it took, but thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.